Okay, this is going to be Neonatal Emergencies Part 1. And, and in this section we're going to talk about introduction and anatomy and physiology. Uh, 2002, we pretty much had about four, a little over 4 million births in the United States. About 6% of those required life support in the emergency department and the delivery room. For those, of, for those that had birth weights less than 1,500 grams, 60% uh, of those needed resuscitation and about 20 to 30 percent of the neonates less than 24 weeks gestation are, are viable to begin with. Um, the, the lungs needed to develop somewhere around 30 weeks or so or over 37 would be ideal um, and what this does is it doesn't allow them to have surfactant so their lungs will collapse very easily. Morbidity and mortality decreases when neonates receive NICU care uh, critical care transport teams uh, needs to be able to give NICU level care. Uh, treatment and transport environment should be pretty much an extension of the NICU or the neonatal intensive care unit. We're going to talk about anatomy in this section and physiology and the differences. Uh, physiology of thermal regulations. Now the neonates are a significant risk for hypothermia. The ratio of neonate body surface um, area to volume is four times that of an adult. Neonates are, have less adipose tissue than an adult does. Their ability to generate heat or thermogenesis is only about one and a half times greater than an adult and their muscle tone is immature. Uh, neonates cannot shiver effectively enough to generate heat. Heat loss in the neonate results from a, from a few things that we're going to talk about here. One is evaporation. Uh, most of the heat loss works out this way, uh, especially in moments immediately after birth or wet, uh, evaporation starts to occur. Convection depends on the birthing environment. When the care providers are comfortable in the room, it's too cold for the neonate. Conduction, please keep them on warm surfaces or they can lose body heat very rapidly. Radiation, uh, room's ambient temperature should be as close to the core temperature as possible, so the actual room needs to be fairly warm. Uh, and these are some graphics here. Convection, air current blows the heat away and child loses heat. Uh, radiation, um, child loses heat through radiation. Uh, surface and the overall ambient temperature. Um, and then radiating heat would, would decrease or increase their amount of heat loss. Uh, moisture with dry air evaporation occurs. And then conduction, if this was cold, they're going to lose their heat through it. Glucose requirements. Newborns are a significant risk of acute hypoglycemia due to poor glucose stores, inability to stimulate the immature neonatal liver to release glucose. Um, glucose is stored in the form of glycogen, polysaccharide chains. Increased metabolism that uses large quantities of available glucose. Assess neonate glucose level within about one to two hours after the birth. We should reassess this every 30 minutes to an hour thereafter. Um, until the glucose levels are normal. Neonatal blood glucose levels should be maintained at about 70 to 80 milligrams per deciliter. Hill sticks will do just fine. Uh, signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, twitching, seizure activity, eye rolling, muscular hypotonia or limpness, high-pitched cry, respiratory apnea, irregular respirations are all signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Whenever we manage hypoglycemia in the neonate, we administer 10% dextrose. Now, we generally have it in the form of 50% dextrose. So a very quick way for us to achieve somewhere around a 10% concentration solution is going to be giving them a 12.5% solution. And that is facilitated or made by squirting three quarters of the amount of dextrose 50% out and then filling it up with normal saline. It will give us 12.5% solution, and then at that point we can give them 1 to 2 milliliters per kilogram. Airway anatomy and physiology. The unique differences between the neonate and the adult airway. Uh, the neonatal tongue is larger compared to the oropharynx. Little room for airway edema if we have any. Increased likelihood of airway obstruction in the depressed neonate. Neonatal tracheas are more pliable and they're narrow. Airway obstruction results from hyperextension and hyperflexion or kinking of the neck or edema. Now, these two right here is why we put children or neonates into a sniffing position. 
there's a sweet spot to their airway, which is essentially a neutral inline position. Uh, the best way to facilitate that during chest compressions would be to slip your fingers underneath their scapular areas and perform a two-handed technique. Uh, neonate's epiglottis is larger and more U-shaped or oblong. Uh, it's floppy from incomplete cartilaginous support. Makes it harder to kind of control with the, with the blade. Uh, the use of a straight blade is suggested over a curved blade during laryngoscopy. Neonatal larynx are more cephalid or the more anterior. Um, level of the first or second cervical vertebra is where, the, where you can find them. They're harder to achieve a single plane view needed for optimal oral tracheal intubation conditions. It's just a little more difficult to intubate a neonate. Uh, they're a little anterior, the epiglottis is kind of out of control, things are smaller. Uh, in pediatric patients, the adult airway is roughly about the size of a dime. Pediatric patients in general, and the neonates are even smaller, is about one third that size. <clears throat> pulmonary anatomy physiology. Many differences in the neonates pulmonary anatomy physiology compared to the adult. Bones of the neonatal thoracic area are not fully calcified, which makes it more flexible. Neonatal ribs are more horizontal than they are rounded, which provides very little leverage to increase the anterior and posterior diameter of the chest. The inability to provide the degree of lift needed to increase the volume of the chest cavity upon inspiration. So this kind of gets in the way of them ventilating. Their chest is small, they don't have a lot of muscle tone, and it, it hampers their ability to inspire air. Poorly developed accessory muscles causes diaphragmatic breathing. Neonatal septums are pliable, which contributes to the inability to create a strong negative interthoracic pressure. Inhibits efficiency of the inspiratory effort. So their body position and their musculature and the things that are developed are kind of hampered uh, their ability to inspire air. Neonates have diminished pulmonary reserve capacity. Uh, their heart is larger, ribs and sternum fail to adequately support the lungs. Less space for lung expansion compared to adults. More rapid development of hypoxemia and hypercapnia or high CO2 levels. Neonates are primarily abdominal breathers rely heavily on the diaphragm motion to breathe. Uh, overcrowding of the neonate abdominal cavity uh, is a significant problem. Negatively affects the neonate's compensatory ventilation mechanism and limits diaphragmatic excursion, uh, secondary to increased abdominal pressure. If you have done any sort of BLS airway maneuvers and have blown up their stomach, their stomach pressure can easily displace the diaphragm and cause it not to uh, cause expansion of the chest that is appropriate. Please uh, run an oral gastric tube down there and pull all the air if you have blown a little bit of air into their stomach. Neonates consume twice the oxygen of adults. Lower pulmonary reserve capacity coupled with a higher metabolic demand for oxygen predisposes the neonate to hypoxemia. Cardiovascular anatomy and physiology, one of six. Uh, several differences between an adult and a neonate's cardiovascular system. Uh, while they're still in utero and the, the fetus receives its oxygen through the placenta, disturbances to the alveolar ventilation and gas exchange following birth must be dealt with immediately. Whenever they're still inside mom or in utero, the placenta is their lifeline. So the red here is highly oxygenated blood. When it gets into the system, it enters into, this is the venous ductus right here. I should probably change colors on the, let's go with something like that. Right here is the ductus venosus. Now, what that does is, is that loads oxygenated blood into the inferior vena cava and the ductus arteriosus up here allows for collateral circulation. Um, the return lines and the actual um, output line are attached. So this all comes through the umbilical vein and the arteries actually bring back deoxygenated blood in the placenta. So things are a little backwards before they're actually born. 
the lungs, make point of this, have never inflated at this point. And there's no air that's been in them. Cardiovascular anatomy physiology 3 of 6. Uh, neonate's heart can usually only increase rate to improve the cardiac output, cannot increase the contractile force strength. Uh, cardiac output drastically reduces with bradycardia. Bradycardia can be fatal in a, in a, in a neonate. <clears throat> Most of the physiological change that occurs with the shift of intrauterine to extrauterine life occurs within the first few minutes after delivery. Clamping of the umbilical cord moves circulation from the placenta to the pulmonary system. Interruption of the low resistance, the placental blood flow from the umbilical cord increases systemic vascular resistance. So once the umbilical cord is clamped, the SVR, or the systemic vascular resistance, or the pressure within the system increases. Increased SVR closes the ductus venosus, and that would be the input feed on the inferior vena cava. Closure of the ductus venosus causes renal perfusion. So once we've closed this essentially third portal, if you will, uh, what this does is this pressurizes the system and the organs start becoming perfused. Neonate's first breath expands the lungs. Lung expansion reduces the pulmonary vascular resistance. Reduced pulmonary vascular resistance increases pulmonary blood flow. Reduces pulmonary artery pressures. Left side of the heart assumes a higher pressure than the right. Closes the foramen oval. Closes the ductus arteriosus. So this was the holes that were in between and the holes between the return pipe and the actual aorta. And this occurs, this, this one here occurs within the first few hours or weeks after the actual birth. All right, so this is a quick overview. Initial initiation of respiration, expansion of the lungs, increased PO2 levels. This right here in the oxygen moving in decreases pulmonary vascular resistance, increases pulmonary blood flow, increases pressure of the left atrium, closes the foramen oval, decreases right atrial pressure at the same time. Uh, so the right atrial pressure, pretty much, it was the powerhouse before, but after the heart beats the first time and the lungs expand, now it's the low pressure side. On this side of it, down here, increased systemic vascular resistance decreases your systemic venous return, and the, the venous return side, um, a CVP pressure, should be no more than six millimeters of mercury. So we are under very low pressure whenever uh, the superior and inferior vena cava are returning blood supply into the heart. Cessation of the umbilical venous return, closure of the ductus venosus, and this was the end feed off of the placenta into the uh, inferior vena cava. This also increases systemic resistance greater than the pulmonary, closure of the ductus arteriosus, and this was where we allowed for collateral circulation between the pulmonary veins and the aorta. And the pulmonary resistance less than the systemic causes a left or right shot. So all of this happens whenever kiddo takes his first breath. Assessment of the respiratory system. Autology of the respiratory, of respiratory compromise may not be readily identifiable. Your first goal is to replace any lost function of the airway or breathing components. Once airway and breathing insults are corrected, you can identify potential problems causing any kind of hemodynamic or respiratory compromise. Goals in managing respiratory compromise in the critical care environment are to identify this, the set of causes and the most likely causes, and then once we have identified those causes, we should treat the most likely etiology that is present. Respiratory distress, failure, and arrest, and these um, these definitions here, we'll talk about those here in just about two seconds. Must use precise terms when describing respiratory distress, respiratory failure, and respiratory arrest. Distinction between the three dictates the management of the acutely ill neonate. Respiratory distress maintains the ability to compensate. So as long as they have the ability to oxygenate the peripheral tissues and maintain cardiac output, if they have an increased work of breathing, or they look like they're in a little bit of distress or having a hard time with breathing, once it adjusts their appearance or their circulation to their skin, then they're no longer in distress, they're in failure. 
respiratory failure has exhausted the compensatory mechanism. So this would be decompensation without the ability to compensate for the, uh, the actions and the physiology that's present. And respiratory arrest, last but not least, is an apneic patient. This is going to end part one. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My name is Roy Smith, roy.smith at redlandcc.edu or smithr at imsa.net. Thank you.